Good morning. Welcome and thank you for attending our webinar this morning on Peaceful School Bus. I want to assure everybody that I am recording this session and we will have a link available on our Canaan.com website and this webinar recording can be assigned using your Kenan Safe Schools program. You can assign it out to any of your bus drivers if you feel that's applicable. You just need to contact your account manager or your risk manager and they can help with that process. Again, our program this morning is on Peaceful School Bus and we are very happy this morning to have Jim Dillon. Jim Dillon has been an educator and a school administrator for over 35 years. While he was the principal of Linwood Elementary in New York, he developed this Peaceful School Bus program. It's designed to prevent and reduce bullying. He subsequently published the Peaceful School Bus program with Hazelden and Oveas. He's the author of The No Place for Bullying, Leadership for Schools that Care for Every Student. Jim was named Principal of the Year in 2007 by the Greater Capital District Principal Center and he is currently a Certified Olveas Bullying Prevention Program Trainer. We're very excited to have you with us this morning, Jim. I will turn it over to you and you can take it from here. Well, thank you very much, Kathy, and thank you everyone for joining and for your interest in what I have to share. I hope you find what I uh, share to be helpful to you. Um, but before I just get into the objectives, I do want to emphasize what Kathy talked about, about me being uh, an educator for 35 years and a principal for over 20 years. And the story I hope to tell about how we addressed our bus problems, I want to just emphasize, really came out of a school grappling with issues. It wasn't a program that we just sort of sat down and said, oh, this sounds good. It really came out of our day-to-day confrontation with bus problems and how our school community worked together to try to approach the problem in a different way. And what I hope to offer to you today is a different way of looking at the problem and thinking about it. And we're going to do that first by looking at, I think, very dramatic differences between the school environment and the school bus environment. And from that, I will explain why traditional approaches that we've typically used to try to solve the problems on the school bus really don't work because that school bus environment is so much different. And from there, I hope to articulate a set of principles <clears throat> that school stands, <clears throat> excuse me, that school staff and transportation personnel can work together to develop strategies for preventing and reducing bullying on the school bus. And I will explain how, by building a strong community on the school bus, we can empower bystanders to really be key players in preventing and reducing bullying. And I hope to go over specific strategies that are part of the Peaceful School Bus Program that really build community and empower bystanders and promote greater teamwork among the staff in the school and the transportation staff. <clears throat> but I want to start with a story. And the story is sort of an epiphany as a principal when I realized that maybe we had to go in a different direction regarding what was happening on the school bus. And the moment occurred when one of our top students sort of a, one of our best citizens in the school building came before me because of a referral by the bus driver about some very inappropriate and bullying type behaviors that occurred on the bus. And I was stunned to find this student sitting in front of me and he was quite upset. And when I looked at him and I had a very good relationship with him and said to him, why did you do what you did? He looked at me with very sincere eyes and said, I don't know, and started crying. And at that moment, I realized that there's something different going on 
on the bus than what goes on in school. Because when I looked at what was happening in school, we had worked together very well to create a school environment where kids felt like they had a sense of community in the classroom and with the whole school. And kids felt that they had choices and that they could make good decisions. And the teachers were there to help kids develop those skills. And because of that, we found our typical discipline problems really uh, reducing and that teachers were spending more time integrating social-emotional learning right into the classroom, having classroom meetings, and they bought into the whole idea that you just don't discipline kids by using rewards and punishments, that you really have to invest time in kids. And we really found that paying off. We used a lot of cooperative learning and a lot of tools like that. But what stunned me was all that good work came to a halt outside once we got outside of the school and didn't seem to have any effect on that school bus. So really what we decided to do is saying, rather than say, looking at this problem by itself, we said, look at what we're doing that's working. Sort of find the bright spots in our school and just say, if it can work in our school, let's make it work on the bus. And that really is what we did. But I'll explain that as we go on. The first step, I think, to really approach uh, discipline and bullying on the school bus is to really examine the difference between the school bus and the school. And these are general statements. I know every school might be different, but I think they hold for a lot of schools. First and foremost, the school bus has mixed ages, whereas we typically educate our kids being in the same age group and by grades. So kids are in school, they're basically interacting with kids who are similar to them. But yet when they get on the bus, they face a mixed group of kids of different age range. And that's a whole different social world that they have to deal with. In school, teachers can be very effective in creating a calm and quiet environment for learning. Now, if you're doing cooperative learning, I'm sure there's talking in the classroom, but the teacher has a great deal of control over creating the type of environment that's going to be conducive for learning. That is very difficult to do on the school bus. And just physiologically, uh, a quiet environment as opposed to a loud and stimulating environment really creates almost a whole different type of physiological response. Third, in the school, if you look at it, everybody who's hired and is working in that school is there to pay attention to kids. That's their focus. They're not doing another job. They're not cooking dinner or doing laundry. They're there to focus on kids and help kids. But yet on the school bus, the driver have to, has to sort of manage the kids, but has a very important other job, which is to drive the school bus. And it occurred to me to think that a driver can really be successful in managing a school bus by him or herself while he or she has to drive the bus would be like asking even your best teacher in the school to deliver a lesson with their back to the students and, and then control behavior with their back to the students. Even the best teacher would have a hard time doing that. But that's sort of what we maybe implicitly expect bus drivers to do. The other thing which I think is really important and plays into the whole problem is what kids recognize as being important. Even kids who have difficulty in school would acknowledge that school is an important place. And for kids, home and school are two key environments that they know are important. But yet, I don't think kids necessarily think that the school bus is an important place. And we adjust our behavior to the environment we're in, depending upon how important we feel that environment is. 
So in a way, unless we change this mindset or perception of students, they could inadvertently end up thinking that the school bus is more a means to an end. It's not important. It's just the way to get from one important place home to school. And if I don't think that that environment is important, I'm not going to maybe devote as much of my uh, attention to my behavior. And that's sort of emphasized by the fact that schools have a clear identity. They have a name. They have a sense of uh, importance just because we, we call it by a name. School buses tend to be nameless, and that only adds to the perception that what happens on the bus is not important. And also, if you even factor in there, kids sort of know that what happens on that bus is not automatically going to be communicated to home or school. So it's almost like what I like to say. It's sort of like a school bus can be like Las Vegas. Uh, what happens on the bus stays on the bus, and the kids somehow know that or, or, or think that. <clears throat> the other thing is kids pay attention to and attribute authority to people who they consider to be high status. So even if they may have problems with the teacher, they know a teacher is important. And somehow I think kids can inadvertently and mistakenly not attribute that type of status to the person who drives the bus. And if they are cooperating and working with a teacher, sometimes they have a need to show, well, here's an, an adult that I don't have to uh, worry about. And that contributes to the fact that they may not cooperate as well with a bus driver as they would with a teacher or somebody in the school. <clears throat> the other thing, if you start to look at bullying and, and you look at what things bystanders can do or what things kids can do if they want to avoid bullying, one of the key strategies is giving those kids options to walk away. They can move to another spot. You really can't do that on the school bus. So really, for kids who can be targets of bullying or kids who are bystanders, you don't have those options. And I'll get into this a little bit later. When it comes to, to bullying, we really have to think of it almost like a musical chord. There's three key components. There's the student who bullies, the student who's the target of the bullying, but then the audience. And really, if you look at the research, the audience plays a key role in whether bullying either decreases or increases because most bullying is done for the audience's sake. It's done for certain reasons to impress an audience or to gain um, an alliance with a certain social group. So in a sense, even if there are bystanders who want to move away from that bullying and sort of take the audience away, they can't. So kids who bully, in a sense, do have a captive audience. So this is a very difficult environment to, to manage. And if bullying can happen under the radar in school, and if you look at the statistics that over 27% of kids who report being bullied on a frequent basis say that it can happen in the classroom with the teacher present. Bullying can happen under the radar right in the classroom. So you can make a strong case that if it happens under the radar in school, you can there's even no radar on a bus. So to sum all that up, it's pretty clear that what works in one environment doesn't transfer to another. Now, what does typically work in schools? Because teachers are there to watch kids and supervise them. They can, and a lot of schools have very a system of rewards and consequences. Um, some schools have more structured approaches than others. But if you look at the environment of the school, it's designed <clears throat> 
to recognize positive behavior and provide consequences for negative behavior, that can work in school. That same system, that same approach, that way of managing student behavior that we could think of as traditional discipline is not designed to work for an environment like the school bus, as I just explained. Now, hopefully I'm going to explain a little bit more detail when that's the case. So if we look at traditional school discipline of recognizing positive behavior, giving consequences for inappropriate behavior, and all that comes with that, and also the fact that there's adults there watching kids all the time and managing and structuring their behavior, that's a good tool. We don't want to throw that out. But it's a tool that's not designed for the school bus. It would be like asking somebody to build a house with just using one tool. It could be a great tool, but you need more than one. So what I hope to do is expand your notion of what tools you can use. It doesn't mean that your traditional discipline approach or what you might already be using has to be discarded. It's really adding to your tool belt and sort of customizing and giving you more tools so that you can um, solve a more difficult, complex problem. Now, when we use a piece of school bus and we try to take some of the things that we did in school and apply it to the bus, we did find we got some really positive success. <clears throat> Ironically, I wasn't really that articulate in being able to describe why it was successful. But when I had the opportunity to write the book and really stop and think through it, and I'm writing uh, a book that I just finished about uh, leadership and bullying, I've been able to sort of look into some of the research on human behavior and, and bullying prevention and understand even in greater depth why a program uh, like the Peaceful School Bus, <clears throat> I think, works. So I'm going to share some of that research. First of all, if we just look at the brain research, you could say that there's basically two types of brains. There's a rational or logical brain that we use to figure things out. And then there's an emotional brain that just sort of responds to situations. If you look at traditional tools of discipline, they're very much based upon kids making rational decisions, meaning, oh, I can see that if I do that, I can get this. Or I see if I do this, I, I'll get this consequence. And for us being rational people and adults, it makes sense. Well, why would somebody rationally decide to do something um, wrong if they see that there's going to be consequences to pay? And that makes sense. And we base a lot of our approach thinking about deterrence and incentives. If kids were using a rational mind on the school bus, that might work. But in many, many cases, the school bus is a much more emotional environment, not one that's conducive to rational thought. And in fact, we condition kids to be used to structure and order in the school. And they learn to function and they get into the habits that that structure and environment require. When you get on the bus, you're throwing that out. You, you can't maintain that same level of structure and predictability and, uncertain, and certainty. When kids are thrown into situations that have less predictability, less structure, less certainty, they're automatically moving much more into an emotional state. Things that they tend to rely on in school are not there. So we're asking them to deal and navigate and function, function as a very different environment that's much more calling on them to manage their emotions and to recognize them and, and, and to deal with them. A 
second piece of research which is very interesting to me is research that looked into the two main types of kids who bully. I'm going to start with some of you might be old enough to remember a TV show called Leave it the Beaver. And there was a character in that show called Eddie Haskell. And he was a friend of um, Beaver and his brother. And the funny thing about him was that when he came into the household of this family, he had the best manners. He was the most well-behaved. He commented, uh complimented the mother and the father, but yet when he stepped outside of the house and was there just with his friends and the social thing, he could be a real wise guy. And when they looked at research that identified kids who are very socially skilled, who have learned how to bully, and they typically do it for social reasons. It's not typically kids who are the most popular. It's very often kids who want to become more popular, and they use bullying as a way to move up the social ladder, so to speak. So those kids are very skilled, and they're also very skilled at picking kids who don't have a lot of allies or people set up for them. So they're, they're, they're very skilled in getting away with it, picking uh, the students who they feel uh, will not have people to back them up. So that's one type. <clears throat> the other type are kids who are called bully victims or provocative victims. And these are kids who don't have those types of social skills. They may have attention deficit problems. They may just have um, learning problems. They could just be kids who just don't fit in socially. And typically, they can be uh, become targets. When they become targets, one thing they do is then look to raise their status by becoming bullies themselves. And they may look for kids who are younger than they are rather than being in the same age or peer group. But they're not skilled enough to get away with it. So if you look at those two types of, of kids, it creates a very interesting uh, setup on the bus and I'll get to that in a little bit. The second bit of research goes back to the, the slide I showed of the brain, is that there's a lot of research looking at self-regulation skills, and kids have different degrees of it. Some kids are very good at regulating their emotions, and other kids aren't. And I showed the marshmallow. You might be familiar with a, one test that was done with very young kids where they were told, you know, if you... Um, I'm going to put a marshmallow in front of you, but I'm going to go off for a little bit. If I come back and you can wait and not eat the marshmallow, I'll give you two. The kids who at a young age of, of three, three or four were able to wait and defer gratification and got the second marshmallow. Those kids, when they track their achievement over 20 years, had a much higher level of achievement and success in life than kids who just ate that one marshmallow. So that's a critical piece of research to know about because kids are even going to have more problems with self-regulation on the school bus. Go back to the thing about the different types of, of um, kids who bully and what I said about Kids can bully in school and get away with it. The research bears that out. Maybe 5% of bullying is seen by adults in school. 95% is unseen. That's in school. Now think what it is on the bus. But think about the kids who might end up getting caught. I think it's those bully victim kids. Those kids are the ones who may not even have the social skills to do it on the school bus. So unfortunately, we, we may feel sometimes that we're getting those kids who bully, but we are not getting anywhere near the number of kids who might be doing it. 
So if you look, if we stick with bullying as a crime using traditional discipline uh, approaches where we're going to focus on the kids who break the rules and apply rewards or punishments, so to speak, kids who are skilled at bullying really know they can beat the odds. So why worry about what the consequences are if I don't feel I'm going to get caught? So if we continue to sort of approach bullying sort of through a criminal justice mindset, we're not going to be very successful. Because if bullying stays as a crime, so to speak, it's easy to commit and deny and very hard to prove. And that is, a, when I speak to principals, that is one of their biggest frustrations. Because they'll get a complaint about bullying, and they'll go about investigating it the way they would a report of a crime, and they can't gather the evidence, and they pretty much then say, there's nothing I can do. And then parents feel like the administrators don't care and they're not doing anything. So those kids who are the bully victim, in a sense, get a double whammy. They, They get bullied by their peers, but yet when they try to bully, they get caught by adults. One other interesting piece of research that I think factors into bystanders' behavior often is some interesting research on willpower. And just to summarize this up very quickly is um, they'll take two groups of people who haven't eaten in a while and put down a plate of cookies and a plate of radishes And they'll say to one group of people, um, you know, if you're hungry, you can eat the cookies. The other group of people, they'll say, no, don't eat the cookies. They need to stay there. But if you're hungry, you can eat the radishes. Well, if you're hungry, cookies are much more appealing than radishes. Well, what they found after they did that experiment, they then gave those people uh, a test where they had to figure things out, like a crossword puzzle or something that, tax their thinking skills. And what they found was the people who had to exert willpower and, and, and keep themselves from eating the cookies had a much more difficult time dealing with the frustration of figuring out a problem, where the people who were allowed to eat the cookies did much better on those same problems. So if we look at school, If we're challenging kids in school, which I hope we are, and I think most schools do, where they have to think, they have to problem solve, they have to manage the school day, they're putting out six or seven hours of willpower, so to speak. So, and for kids who struggle more in school, their success might require even more willpower. So if that's a finite amount that gets depleted, when they get on the bus at the end of the day, and that's when I found most school bus problems to happen, they have very little willpower. And the next thing is those kids are very influenced much more by peers than by adults. So when you put all that research on human development and social psychology together, it, I think, leads to taking a different approach. And that's very hard because we tend to want to go at problems very directly. And as adults, administrators, and teachers, we like to feel we can be in control of our problems. But all that research and all we know about bullying really says that we have to be indirect, that the more direct and controlling we try to be, the harder it is to really get at the heart of this problem. And that we really sort of have to be more subtle and direct in the way we have to work through the students. Because what's going to influence them and affect their behavior is to help them understand what other students think. That, that's why we have to give them opportunities for them to talk and, and to voice what they feel and sort of start to shape the cu- cultural and social norms. And that is really what the peaceful bus program tries to do. Just one interesting bit of research that even shows the power of that is they did this study where 
they ask kids to write down if they bully or how much bullying they thought other kids did. And what they found was kids overestimated the amount of bullying they thought was going on. And they overestimated what other, um, how other kids thought about bullying. So all that these researchers did was take the real uh, facts and data, which was that most kids don't bully and most kids don't approve of it, and they put them up on posters around the school. So that kids ended up seeing, hey, I don't approve of bullying, and you know what? I'm in the majority. So if most kids don't think bullying is good, then that's the crowd I want to travel with. But if they don't think that other kids think that, I'm less likely to act in a way that shows my disapproval of bullying. So really changing those social and cultural norms of the school bus is really how we can shape the behavior on the bus. <clears throat> and as I said, we have to try to approach the traditional one. We have to be preventive. We can't wait for incidents of bullying to happen and then deal with it after the fact. And a lot of times, even when it happens, we're not very effective in dealing with those because we don't get the evidence, so to speak. We have to focus on all the students, not just the kids who we feel are doing the bullying or the kids who might be victims or targets. We have to really not rely on that criminal justice mindset, but really say we can do a lot to educate kids to learn about bullying and for them to be effective in reporting or intervening. And in a way, we have to move from our external control of kids to helping them develop in internal controls. And maybe a good way to think of this, I used to think that the most effective teacher in my school would be the one who ran a class that when a substitute teacher came in, that class functioned the same way that the class did when the regular teacher was there. And if you looked at why that teacher got that level of success when she wasn't there, she invested in the kids. She got a sense of ownership. She had the kids feel like this is our class. She coached them, and, and she prepared them. And they internalized the values of the class that the teacher helped promote. So how do we do, do that? How do we move towards empowering kids and, and going at the problem differently? Uh, there's four key sort of principles or tenets of the piece of school bus. One is taking the bus route group and turning it into a community, giving it an identity, empowering the students that are on the bus, and then creating a greater sense of teamwork between uh, transportation personnel school personnel, and students. What we really want to do, and this is the big overarching concept of the peaceful school bus approach, it's taking a group of kids who just happen to be together on that bus at all different ages and making them a community. And what I would say to the students in my school and, and to parents when I would talk to them, What's the difference between a group and a community? And to me, a community is a group of people where everybody cares about what happens to each member. And I don't think you can say that happens automatically on the bus. <clears throat> on the bus, you may care about what happens to the people that you like. And that becomes a criteria a lot of times for how kids behave as bystanders. But if you promote community and you give the message in a very explicit way and coming out and saying it to the kids, you have to care about what happens to everybody, even if you don't like that student. And that's really the essence of what it means to be a good bystander. And we do that in the peaceful school bus by taking the fact and that in most cases there is a mixture of ages and taking those older kids and giving them opportunities to act in a hopeful way with the younger kids. We're sort of changing the identity of the kids who have the most power on the bus and instead of leaving them in an environment where they can become a boss because it's unstructured, say to them, 
no, y- your identity is to be a leader and a helper. And you ha- but you can't just say that to kids. You have to give them experiences where they do helping. And when you bring the bus route group into the building, which is part of what the peaceful school bus requires, you create opportunities for the older kids to help the younger kids. And what we do to build that community, and some of them are just simple activities where you get all the kids together in the school building and they interview each other to find out what their favorite thing is. Or they do an activity where they have to go around and say, find somebody who um, likes doing a certain activity or has been to a certain um, vacation spot. These are fun activities that you can find in a lot of activity books, and and they're meant to be fun, and they're meant for kids to become people to each other rather than just a, a body or another object on the bus. Because if I get to know you, and if I get to know that you like what I like, or we root for the same baseball team, or we've been to the same vacation spot, it becomes a little bit harder to bully you. So these are just some of the activities that can be done in the peaceful school bus for, to, get, to help people get to know each other, and when people get to know each other, they become more of a community. Well, then we want to tell the kids that what happens on the bus is important, and your behavior on the bus is important. Well, we can't say that unless we start to say that the bus is important, and things are important that have identities. When a a child joins a sporting team, that team has an identity, has a name, and you feel connected to that group because that group has a name. So part of what the Peaceful School Bus aims to do is to change the bus and give it not just a number but a name. A very simple activity would just be at the beginning of the school year having the kids and the bus driver pose for a picture, like a team picture, and stand in front of the school bus and take the picture and then take that picture and put it up in the school. And activities we do to do that is even having kids submit names for what they want to name the bus or draw a picture of the bus and draw how you think the bus should look like for everybody to be safe. Or you have activities where we say to kids, what do you hope happens on the bus, and what are you afraid of happening on the bus? And then they go around and share those things. So kids can hear how each member of that school bus feels about riding the bus. And then we just do a simple thing where we, activity called Vital Statistics, where we just list um, how many kids ride the bus, when was the school bus built, how long has the bus driver been driving the bus, all piece of information that helps kids see that the bus is important. Now, empowerment is another key part, as I talked about all the research with bystanders and kids. And we have to look at what's going on in a bullying situation and then also what's going on inside the minds and hearts of a bystander. Because most kids don't approve of bullying, but wanting and having empathy, excuse me, does that mean you have the skills to do something about it? So we want to explicitly teach problem-solving skills about typical problems that happens on the bus. In, in a way, think of it like coaching kids for sports. If we want kids to do well in a sporting event, they have to practice and rehearse. So then when they go into that situation, they have background knowledge and they have specific skills that they can call on to use. We put kids on the bus without preparing them, without giving them certain key words to say, without giving them a variety of strategies. And if they're in an emotional state, even if they have these ideas and strategies, unless they rehearse them and have them readily available in their minds, they're not going to use those things. So then they get off the bus, and they often feel like, how could I let that happen? So we want to prepare kids for riding the bus. And we have activities in the peaceful school bus that are designed to give kids those skills, to give them a a rehearsal, 
for typical problems that's happening on the bus. So we have activities related to stories about how do you deal with, you know, older kids in older grades who sort of take ownership and don't let younger kids move to the back of the bus. We do uh, video clips you can show kids. So the way you would watch uh, instant replay in sports, you show video clips of of bus situations, stop the video and say to kids, what do you think the the target is feeling? What do you think the bystander should do? What do you think is going on inside the kid who bullies? And then we have kids generate a list of solutions to problems. So we build empathy and skills and give them rehearsal time. Then the last, and uh, these are not in order of importance, they're all important, is to make sure the kids know that the bus driver and school personnel are part of the same team. And if bus drivers don't come into the building or they're seen as sort of separate from the school, their status is lowered. So kids have to get the sense that the school and the bus are really extensions of each other, that the school day begins and ends on the school bus. And you have to make that concrete. So kids have to see bus drivers and principals and teachers physically in the same space interacting with each other. And even in a simple thing of having the kids in the peaceful school bus session write a thank you letter to the school bus. Or what we would do is after we uh, did the peaceful school bus for a while, we would share our results to the kids about our improvements because we wanted the kids to see that they were part of the team and that if we took ownership and we cared about what happened on the school bus, that we could really make the bus the type of place where kids didn't have to be afraid and where they could have a good ride to school. Here are the essential elements of the peaceful school bus. First and foremost, there's got to be leadership. Staff have to buy into this. They have to understand it. It can't just be a program and say, hey, we're going to do this and it's going to solve our problems. They have to understand why it works and why we have to take a different approach. So you need to establish a team of people and parents can be on the team, teachers, a bus driver can be on the team, the principal have to be on the team to say, let's address how we're going to handle our bus problems. You need to take the bus route group and meet with them in the building. You can't have a meeting on the school bus. Kids can't just sit on the bus and look at the back of each other's heads. They have to have the opportunity to be face-to-face. -face. When you bring that bus route group into the building, you do have to do activities with the older and younger kids working together. The bus driver, if possible, can participate in those activities inside the building, but you can't depend upon the bus driver to lead those activities. So I like to say the bus driver has to see the kids in a different light, be seen in the building with the administrators and the teachers, but ultimately they become the beneficiary of the program. Now, that becomes a synergistic type of situation and that once the bus drivers feel greater support and that the schools do something tangible and positive to help them do their job, they feel less anxious and they end up making better decisions and they end up coming to the principal or the teacher that's maybe assigned to their bus route group and report problems uh, when they're smaller rather than waiting for them to get uh, bigger or uh, damage control type of problems. So they tend to have more trust that the school's going to listen to them if they come and say, hey, something's starting to become a problem, and could you talk to these kids before it gets out of hand? But unless they feel that the school is backing them up and, and, and will listen to them and not say, hey, why don't you solve it, they're not going to come forward. So they'll hold back until the problem gets out of hand. There's got to be a long-term commitment to this because 
these behaviors of the kids and everybody don't change overnight. And you can't sort of change the culture of a school bus overnight. But if you're going in the right direction and you understand what you're doing and you're building community, you can see long-term gains. We went from 58 bus referrals before we started the program, and within six years, we were down to under 10 per year. And that happened when the kids who were in kindergarten, who were in the piece of school bus, became our fifth graders. That's when we really saw a big improvement. So you do have to collect data uh, to measure your progress. You need to communicate with the community, and it's got to be a fun activity. Those are the key elements. But I think what's most important is believing that the bus can be a positive environment and that kids are capable of developing the skills, attitudes, and knowledge to become empowered bystanders, good citizens, where they can intervene when they can or they can report. And if that happens, bullying will decrease. Um, a lot of it is being, believing it's possible, that we can envision a school where students can know each other's name, name and the driver does, where there's a sense of community and belonging, where discipline problems are manageable, and when children are physically and emotionally safe. And you can actually have a sense of pride in your bus route group. And if I leave you with one message I think is most important is you have to believe in it. You have to believe it's possible. And I love this quote because it really says it all. If you think you can or think you can't, you're right. I've given some um, contact information. I do keep a blog uh, related to the peaceful school bus and, and bullying issues. Um, I try to expand on a lot of the things that are in the book, or both books I've written. So if you go to the peacefulschoolbus.blogspot, uh, you can see some of my thinking on school bus and bullying. And um, my, my new book that just came out is called No Place for Bullying. Um, it's all about leadership strategies. And I give a little bit of the story of how the Peaceful School Bus came about. There is a chapter in that book related to the bus, but it covers a whole range of um, strategies for school leaders in dealing with bullying. And if you go to the Hazleton website, you can actually see a video on that website. It's also on YouTube of a peaceful school bus session in action in Linwood School when I was principal, where I'm interviewed and some students are interviewed. And I think that will sort of show you uh, how all those strategies actually manifest themselves in school. And with that, um, I have time for questions. Very good. Thank you so much, Jim. We do have uh, quite a few questions, and I'm probably going to get to maybe three or four of them. One of sure. them is the, the concern. We've got a lot of directors of transportation on the line, and time yeah. seems to be yeah. one of the biggest concerns and biggest issues. And obviously, yep. from what you're saying, a team approach is the best. Yep. So on yep. this team, would you suggest the director of transportation work with the principals and the yep. drivers to look at the bus as a whole rather than, hey, this I, is I your also, problem? I would also involve teachers and even parents that team be for each school. Okay. And uh, the way I look at time, uh, one of my favorite sayings is, um, I don't have time to build a fence because I'm too busy chasing my cows. And I, what I found is that the time I put into investigating bullying or behavior problems on the bus um, decreased dramatically when I invested the time up front. But it's very hard to take that leap of faith, so to speak, to see that if you invest in preventive things and you build a stronger culture and you empower kids, that eventually the time you spend in solving problems after they happen will go down. But that is what I found. So 
it does take a commitment and leadership to help people make that investment because you're always going to get from staff or from anybody we don't have time. So at some point in time, uh, leadership has to be able to articulate how investing in positive, proactive, preventive strategies will pay off in the long run. Very good. That brings me to the next question. You mentioned that doing these teamwork type activities in the yes. school building at the beginning of the year. Do you have any yes. suggestions on the intervals? I mean, do you do it at the beginning of yes. every year and that's it? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think there's when you're just starting it, I think you maybe need to do it um, at the beginning of the year and maybe, you know, every two or three months. After it starts going, what we ended up doing, and every school's different, and I think that's where the team has to make decisions about how it best works in that particular school. But what we did in New York State, we were mandated three times a year to do a bus safety drill that the bus drivers would practice um, emergency procedures. What we did at Linwood was we did our peaceful school bus sessions prior to those drills. So it meant that if the drill was scheduled say at um, 8.30, um, we would start our peaceful school bus 15, uh, four, a half hour to 45 minutes before the drill. So the kids did these community building activities. We had a transportation supervisor who would free up the drivers to participate, and then the drivers would lead the kids um, along with the teachers out to the bus and then do the safety drills. And, and they were mandated to do that three times a year, typically in September, December, and, and March. So that's good. Excellent. the schedule that's we follow. Good suggestion. Good. We've got another question about video cameras on the bus. How do these factor in, and what kind of influence do they have versus the... Well, as I said, program? as I said, even with this program, <clears throat> you could still have incidents on the bus. This preschool school bus doesn't eliminate bullying, and I think it's not uh, reasonable to think that because kids are works in progress, and bullying is part of uh, the difficult navigating the social world, and kids are going to make mistakes in navigating the social world. Not that we're going to condone those mistakes, but the same way that kids are going to struggle with reading or with writing, the kids are going to struggle with social issues. So there's still going to be problems, and there still may be some severe instances where you do need to find out what really happened. So the, the video camera has a role to play. But I think the problem is when people look at the video camera as sort of the solution, you're still falling into that criminal justice mindset of, of waiting for the problem to happen and then having evidence. But the other thing to think about is, those skillful kids who bully are going to be able to figure out how to bully even with the cameras right on them because bullying can be a, a, a just a dirty look. It can be a gesture. It can be whispering to the person next to you. Um, when I do my training, I, I show a, a clip of Forrest Gump getting on the school bus where kids just move one inch over and they don't let them sit anywhere. And what I say to people when I present is are you going to write up that uh, behavior as a discipline problem? Or if you saw it on the video, are, are you going to say, oh, this kid should be disciplined? I don't think the parent of that child would would agree with you. They'd say, hey, what did my kid do? He just nodded his head no or moved. But exclusion on a, a repetitive basis is a form of bullying. So cameras have a role to play, but we can't think that, they're, they are the solution. I agree. I know that uh, the role of the bus driver primarily is safety, to get those students from place yeah. one to where they're going. Yeah. But so yeah. many times I hear frustration in the bus drivers that they are in charge of student behavior issues. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. How do you clarify the role of the bus driver? Well, everybody needs to know they have backup. And you operate a lot better knowing when you have backup than, than not knowing you have backup. And one of the strongest things about the peaceful school bus, 
I think, is that it's a dramatic, outward, tangible sign to the bus driver is that you have backup, meaning that if there is a kid who's giving you trouble, if there is things going on, that you don't feel like it's all on you, that you know that the principal, in spite of how busy he or she might be, is going to be there. If you know, if you've established relationships with some teachers in the building, because part of the peaceful school bus is the leaders of the sessions need to be teachers. So that teacher then can become a liaison with that bus driver. So you create more people in the school who are available to be there to help the bus driver. I would have bus drivers come to me and just say, could you give me just some ideas on how to handle some of these kids? Um, Because they viewed me as somebody who was there to help them. So a lot of it is just changing mindset. And here again, I think bus drivers are going to feel much more confident when they know they have backup. And we can't just assume. We say, oh, the bus drivers, they should know that we'll back them up. People need outward signs. And if nothing else, a program like the Peaceful School Bus is an outward sign from the school to the bus driver that you have our support. Excellent. We've got one final question that just came in, and somebody's got a question on how to stop fights on the bus, whether they should try to stop a fight or... Well, yeah, as a, you know, if you're a bus driver, how do you stop fights? Well, I think uh-huh. you have to make a judgment call. Um, you can't let kids get hurt. You may need to pull over, stop the bus, and break up that fight. Um, and then whatever discipline issue uh, or approach you stop that. You know, I, I, there's no program that's going to give a step-by-step answer to, to every problem. What you would hope is to reduce the number of fights. And hopefully, if you can rehearse with kids how to deal with conflicts. So kids have more ways of avoiding fights. See, unless we kids give kids more skills and strategies to how to handle these conflicts or bullying situations, they could end up having a very limited range of skills. So you have to almost look at the world differently and say, if kids have more skills, if we prepare them, if they rehearse, if we invest time in educating kids about what it means to ride the bus, Instead of just sort of throwing them on the bus and hope that they figure it out. I agree. We're have a I very agree. Different types of world. And I agree that we're it's good to start them all early. If you want to go ahead and advance to the next slide, I want to remind everybody that we have got our final webinar on our series on bullying and it's tips for teachers. This will be November fourteenth and we're going to describe the teacher's role in bullying prevention and intervention. Keenan also has a school safety center on our PNC bridge where we have resources for you for bullying, which would be policies and good intervention programs, uh, best practices. We've also got grant funding assistance that was provided to us, grant writing templates that Oveas has allowed us to post on our site. So there's a multitude of information on this center. You just contact your account manager for Keenan, and we can get you plugged in and get you going. Jim, we've about run out of time. It's almost 11 o'clock, and we want to thank you very, very much for taking your time today to help educate our transportation directors on creating that peaceful school bus. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you very much for inviting me. All right. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye.